In today's video, we're going to study how to find eigenvalues, how to find eigenvectors, and how to diagonalize a matrix if you have complex eigenvalues. We've seen before in previous videos, which I'll put down in the description, how to go through this process of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and diagonalization when your eigenvalues are all real. But the process for complex eigenvalues is in many ways much the same, with just a little bit of algebraic trickery to deal with these complex values. So before we jump in, let's just remind ourselves of how we compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and we'll see what to do in the complex case. Indeed, the problem I am trying to solve is that if I have some matrix A and I multiply that matrix to a vector, what an eigenvalue is, is just some number. It's a number lambda. The idea is that multiplying a matrix to an eigenvector is just the same thing as multiplying by a scalar, multiplying by this lambda. So it's lambda multiplied by V. So the lambda is an eigenvalue and the A is an entire matrix. So this is the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. We want to find pairs of eigenvalues and eigenvectors that solve this. My first step is I'm going to take this equation and write it in a very slightly different way. What I'm going to do is instead of just lambda, I'm going to write lambda times i, the identity matrix with all ones along the main diagonal. Taking i times the vectors and doing anything. So it's sort of like a weird way of multiplying by one, which I'm allowed to do. And if I move that to the side, then what I get is that a minus lambda times i multiplied by this eigenvector is nothing but the zero vector. So this is an alternate way to write down the same equation. Now, what I'm interested in is non-trivial solutions to this. I know that v equal to zero is a solution. I'm not going to call v equal to zero an eigenvector. What I'm interested in is non-zero solutions to this particular equation. Now, since we are trying to find these non-trivial solutions, these non-zero solutions, that is equivalent to this claim that the matrix A minus lambda i, the determinant of that matrix, is going to be exactly zero. If the determinant of it was non-zero, it would be an invertible matrix, and V equal to zero would be the only solution. So if there are non-zero solutions, you need to have this determinant, this determinant of A minus lambda i, that has to be exactly equal to zero. So this gives us our eigenvalue eigenvector test. Let's see an example. I'm going to consider the matrix A equal to 0, 1, minus 1, and 0. Note this matrix has real values right now, but it can turn out that the eigenvalues are going to be complex nevertheless. You could also have had A's where there was complex numbers beginning that there was imagined numbers I put in there. That would be fine. It would work out more or less the same way. Nevertheless, I can then go and look at A minus lambda I, and I'm going to put vertical bars around it to denote that I'm taking the determinant. And this is going to be the determinant of minus lambda 1, minus 1, and minus lambda, where the minus lambda is coming from the minus lambda times I, so they go down the main diagonal. This is the same thing as lambda squared minus another minus is going to be plus 1. And then finally, we're setting this equal to 0 because we want our determinant to be 0. But now we have a bit of a problem. Lambda squared plus 1 equal to 0. Well, that's the same thing as lambda is equal to plus or minus the square root of minus 1. Square root of minus 1, we can't solve that with real numbers, but we can with complex numbers. This is nothing but plus or minus the imaginary number i. So what do we have? We have complex valued eigenvalues. In general, for a 2 by 2 system, what we're going to get is a quadratic in lambda. And as you know, a quadratic could be all real, it could be all imaginary, or it could be complex that combine real and imaginary components. So the fact that the original matrix had all real components doesn't mean that your eigenvalues are going to be real. It just depends on the solutions to the quadratic formula. And in cases like this one, we have these purely imaginary eigenvalues. All right, so those are the eigenvalues, but what about the eigenvectors? There's going to be an eigenvector corresponding to lambda equal to plus i, and there's going to be an eigenvector corresponding to lambda equal to minus i. Let's study lambda 1 equal to i first. The first thing I'm going to do is write out this a minus lambda i. Recall that matrix A was 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and so subtracting off by lambda equal to i, is going to give me a minus i 
the one has not changed, the minus one has not changed, and then I subtract off by a minus i. Now recall that our goal here is to solve the a minus lambda i when you multiply it to a vector equal to zero. I'm trying to solve the homogeneous system of equations a minus lambda i v is equal to zero. To solve equations, it's helpful if we put them into row echelon form, if we do row operations to clean it up and try to make it look upper triangular. Well, I can do that, but I have to deal with this imaginary number. If I look at this particular matrix that we have, I've got two different rows, one along the top and one along the bottom. And the kind of things I'm allowed to do when I'm doing row operations, I can multiply a row by a non-zero number. I could add or subtract two rows from each other, and I could interchange the order of two rows. So one thing I could do is I could take this top row here, and I could multiply by the imaginary number i. It's just kind of like multiplying every, an entire row by three. I'm allowed to do that. I can likewise multiply by i. So if I do that, then I get the following thing. This is going to give me this system. If I multiply minus i times i, i times i is minus one. So minus i times i is plus one. This is going to give me the matrix one. Then I multiplied the one by an i, and I didn't touch the bottom at all, so I'm just going to copy and paste that. So this is my multiplying by i on the top row. Now I observe that the top row and the bottom row have some similarities here. If I look in their first components, if I add those two things up together, then they're just going to add up to zero. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take row one and row two. I'm going to add that together, and I'm going to put it in the place of row two. And this is going to give me the following. Well, I'm not touching the bottom or the top row, so it stays exactly the same. 1 plus 1 is 0, and i plus minus i is also equal to 0. So this gives me the matrix 1i, 0, 0. Okay, so I want to find some eigenvectors associated to that. Well, what I have down at the bottom is I have a free column. And what that means is that for the second component, which I'll call v2, I can come here and I can give it any value I wish. How about I just call it generically s, or perhaps I would like to choose a specific value of it and call it equal to 1. It doesn't matter. I'll say why a bit more in a bit. But nevertheless, the bottom row reads 0v1 and 0v2 is equal to 0. So I can set the v2 to be anything. In particular, I choose v2 equal to 1. So then if I read the top row, the top row is going to tell me that 1 times v1 plus i times v2 has to equal out to 0. And we've specifically chosen that this v2 here is just going to be equal to the value of 1. So in other words, this is telling me that my v1 is going to be equal to minus i, that's my value. I've now decided what my v1 is, and I've decided what my v2 is, and so finally I'll write out what my eigenvector that is associated to lambda 1, it's going to be the vector minus i and 1. Excellent. So that is how I found the eigenvector for the first eigenvalue. Let's just quickly check that we can do the exact same thing for the other eigenvalue. So now I'm talking about a second eigenvalue, lambda 2, and now this is equal to minus i. And that means if I write out a minus lambda i, then this is going to be the matrix. Now it's minus lambda, but lambda is negative, so it's a plus i. And then I had a 1, I don't change that. A minus 1, I don't change that. And I put an i there as well. And again, I'm looking for non-zero solution to this. I'm trying to solve for when this matrix times b is 0. Let's row reduce. I'm going to do the same basic trick. I'm going to multiply this top row, in other words, this row 1, I'm going to multiply that this time by minus i. Well, let's see why that might be useful. What's going to happen is that, that if I take i times i, it would give you minus 1. But I, I want them to add up nicely to sort of counteract this minus 1 on the bottom. And therefore, if I multiply by minus i, then what I'm going to get on the top is a 1 there and a minus i there, then a minus 1 and an i. This I can row reduce further. I can go and take row 1 and row 2 and put it in the place of row 2. And this is going to give me, well, I don't touch the top, so 1 and minus i. But along the bottom, I'm going to have a 0, and then minus i plus i is going to give me a 0 there as well. 
So we put it into its row echelon form once again. We do a very similar analysis. We again have a free column down here, so we can have a V1 and a V2, and the V2 can just be anything we wish. So I will again make the arbitrary choice that V2 is going to be equal to 1. And then given that, if I read out what the top row is saying, the top row says that 1 times V1 minus I times V2 has to be equal to 0. I'm following the homogeneous system where this matrix times V is equal to 0. It's always zeros on the right hand side. Okay, so that tells me if V2 is equal to 1, then V1 is just going to be equal to I, and there we have our two values for it. So the V for this eigenvalue is going to be equal to I and 1. One quick point to make, recall that for the V2, I arbitrarily set it equal to 1. The idea with eigenvectors is that there is not one eigenvector associated to any eigenvalue. In fact, there's infinitely many of them. I could take this and I can multiply it by 1, 2, 3, i, 3 plus i. I can multiply it by any complex number, and it would still be an eigenvector. It would still obey a v equals to lambda times v. And as such, I just choose the v2 to be 1 because it was just the simplest one. The only thing I cannot set is equal to 0 because I would just give the trivial solution all over again. I want non-trivial solutions. But Otherwise, I can let it be whatever I want, and 1 is the nicest value. So, summarizing where we're at, we have found two different eigenvalues, i and minus i, and then for each of those eigenvalues, there is a corresponding eigenvector, the minus i1 and the i1, respectively. So, final thing that we're going to do is diagonalize this matrix, which means we want to take the matrix A and write it of the form P, D, P inverse. The idea is that D represents a diagonal matrix, the diagonal matrix that has the eigenvalues along the mine diagonal. And I really like diagonal matrices. I put a video down in the description about why I really like diagonal matrices. And so we're always seeing, if we can, can we take an A and relate it to a diagonal matrix? And this is the process. So here's how it works. This D matrix here, this is just the matrix i, 0, 0, minus i, as in it's got the eigenvalues along the main diagonal. Okay, but what about the p matrix? Well, for the p matrix, the idea here is you put the eigenvectors along the columns. So since we had chosen i to be our first eigenvalue, you put first minus 1, 1, which is the corresponding eigenvector. And then likewise for the other one, it's i times 1, and that's going to give you the value of p. I suppose I should also figure out what the p inverse is going to be, but I've done this all wrong. So p inverse is the inverse of this original matrix p, and we can invert two by two matrices. The formula works as follows. First of all, the main diagonal I want to alternate, so this 1 and this uh, minus i, they exchange places, the so-called a and the d exchange places. And then along the off diagonal, you put in minus i, so there's a minus i there and a minus 1 there. And then up the front, you do 1 divided by ad minus bc. So what is this? ad is going to be equal to minus i and then minus bc, which is just i times 1, so another minus i. So in other words, what you have is a 1 over minus 2i, 1 minus i, minus 1 and minus i. The a here is the same a that we had at the beginning. It's just simply equal to 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And then it's just going to be a check to make sure if you multiply those three matrices out, you indeed get back to the original matrix a. And I'll let you practice your complex matrix multiplication to make sure that that is indeed the case.